Okay, are we gonna do this? Is this what we're gonna be up to tonight? Something crazy? I think so. I think so. Okay. Maybe also do that a little closer to this microphone. Okay. Good afternoon, everyone. My name is Michael Markowski. Welcome to my studio. Today we are going to recreate another painting by another one of my all-time very favorite artists. And today we are going to look at an amazing artist, oh, a, certainly a unique artist of his time. And 500 years after he died, or I guess like 450 or so years after he died, still an incredibly unique figure in the history of art. We're going to be talking about Giuseppe Arcimboldo. I've seen his last name pronounced in a few different ways, Arcimboldo or Arcimboldo. I'm just going to say Arcimboldo because that's just the way I've been saying it for a few decades now. Um, uh, and <laughs> I mean, you can see this is a weird painting, but it's, uh, you know, and again, it, this was painted 500 years ago. I think, what is it? Uh, 15, uh, 1590, I think. Let's come on. This long title, 1590. Yeah, so I guess a little closer to 400 years ago, but still, um, uh, <laughs> if this painting had been made today, I think people would people would still enjoy it. They would find it quite funny and, and different, and um, but not too unusual for many of the things that are being produced by artists around the world these days. But if you imagine what this painting looked like to the eyes of Italians, in uh, the late Renaissance, this would have been about the most unusual thing anyone had ever seen. Now, we are going to try to, our best to paint this incredible painting. Obviously, there's a lot of detail in here, so I'm gonna simplify this and make it a little bit easier. We're gonna take out some of the detail, and uh, uh, but we're still gonna have a lot of fun, and I'm gonna kind of introduce some uh, classical painting techniques as we go here. Now, for, for anyone worried that I was going to stop this crazy thing that I've been doing for the past year, uh, here's about another 60 canvases that I've I've uh, not only took out of the package that I ordered, but I've also gessoed them with a, with uh, some uh, white acrylic gesso, and then literally just minutes before we went live today finished sanding this big block of all of these canvases so they're nice and smooth oh my goodness i love that feeling of a nice smooth new canvas and i have also here's a whole bunch of actually i won't even can't even show it on the screen because there's just so many of them but here's a whole bunch of the upcoming episodes and over the, this coming weekend, I'm going to transfer a bunch of these onto the canvas, so you don't have to watch me tracing. You can we can skip ahead, but oh man, this is heavy. Um, but I tell you, that feels very satisfying to to have a big stack. Like all of these are just all of this potential energy. All of these paintings that will be coming down the pipeline. Okay. So let's get to the matter at hand here. Hi there, Lolly. Nice to see you watching again and painting along with us. So here's the outline for today's uh, today's painting, and you can print this image out, and I'll show you where to find it. And I'm going to show you how to transfer it to the canvas. So in the description below there you'll see a link to a Dropbox folder and you go through here you, these are all paintings that we've already done I've demonstrated how to paint all of these fantastic images from art history um, some for our artists 
like uh, Archimbaldo, who lived 400, 500 years ago. Like there's Leonardo da Vinci in here and Titian. And then there's certain artists that are alive and well um, in here as well. So, you know, there's Picasso, Van Gogh, Frida Kahlo. Um, here upcoming, we got Rembrandt, Edward Hopper, very famous Edward Hopper, the Nighthawks painting. I'm sure you've seen it. Um, a few names you probably haven't seen. This is going to be a fun one. Jay DeFeo, mark your calendar for that. That's going to. She's an amazing artist who did had a really, again, just like Archimbaldo, very unique uh, working process. Basically worked on one painting for her entire life. Right. That's pretty weird, right? So we'll get into that, and then we'll finish out the year with Caspar David Friedrich. Uh, and then starting in January, we're going to be uh, starting the Intro to Painting course all over again. Simultaneous to that, I'm going to be painting the top 40 most expensive paintings ever sold. So we're going to work our way through some of the most famous paintings of all time. At least those are, many of them are in private collections, but... A lot of them were purchased by museums and galleries or by individuals and then donated to museums and galleries. Anyway, while we're right here, I strongly encourage you to join the Facebook group and upload your version of today's painting to the Facebook group here. And you get this awesome, super supportive community of like-minded individuals just like you who are uh, learning how to paint people on different um, parts of that learning journey. Some people who've been painting with me for a year and who are incredible artists already. And there's some people who've just be begun, people who literally just be joined the, the uh, Facebook group just the other day and who are starting from scratch, right? So uh, let's, um, we, this is gonna be a painting that's gonna, I'm gonna tr try to go as quickly as possible here, but it might take us a little bit longer. So um, bearing that in mind, I wanna sort of get this started. And then we'll come back and talk about the biography of Giuseppe Ercimbaldo, or Archimbaldo, or Ercimbaldo, or however else you might want to pronounce his name. Um, so the first thing that, oh, I'm not even at this step yet. I gotta trace this. I gotta, I'm getting ahead of myself. Okay, so the way that I'm gonna do this is I'm gonna use, to, to get this image onto the canvas, obviously I could just draw it. And I did do a whole 40 episode intro to drawing class that many people watching have also done. If you wanna take that class, it's free. The link to it is in the description below. There's a whole playlist of all 40 episodes. If you're interested in learning how to, to make better paintings, knowing how to draw is an essential skill so I'm just gonna but uh, in, <laughs> in the interest of, of getting these paintings done in a timely manner rather than drawing it all out I've provided an outline which you can use to, to transfer so that you're not working on drawing you're working more on learning how to paint right now lots of detail here so I think what I'm going to do is simplify things like all of these grapes I'm just gonna do an outline shape of that and just sort of going to quickly Some of this um, I'll think about like how much detail I want to include at once we kind of get started and we see how time is going but like things I'm not going to trace out every single little grape here because it's just not worth my time it'd be so much easier just to paint a whole bunch of little circles so I'm just gonna kind of tell myself okay this is a big a um, batch of grapes here, more grapes there. So maybe today's episode more than any will be using 
our understanding of drawing to kind of help get this painting done. And again, if you haven't done the drawing class, I wouldn't start panicking and saying, well, I guess I'll have to wait. We'll, we'll take it nice and easy and we'll, we'll, I'll just kind of demonstrate how we'll figure all of this out. Obviously, because, you know, we're, we want to try to get this painting done in a timely manner, that means we're, we're going to sacrifice a, a certain amount of detail and um, fidelity to the original. So anyone looking how to paint this painting like a photocopy machine um, will be disappointed. Right, because you've, if you've been watching me for a while, you know that I'm not really super concerned about becoming a robot. Um, I'm, I've never been interested in becoming a robot, and um, although maybe one day, in like some nightmarish scenario, I will be, my brain will be uploaded to a museum somewhere, and like a the Hall of Presidents at Disney World, I'll just be, someone will buy my brain and put it on display and up, connect it to a computer and I'll be trapped inside. <laughs> you can see I watched way too many kind of Twilight Zone, Black Mirror like episodes. Um, Okay. Obviously, this is going much faster. Like this, probably took me an hour to outline when I when I did this on my iPad Pro using the Procreate app. So I'm going much faster. Also, because the original painting itself is it's uh, it's bigger than this. We'll look at the exact dimensions. I don't know offhand, but. I would venture to say it's probably somewhere around maybe 11 by 17 or tw you know kind of around that age or, or that size because that's sort of typical for um, paintings on panels at this particular period of time like 400 years ago big large canvases really were very very rare most of the most canvases were either actually not even on canvas they were on panels and the technology to make a flat panel of wood was you know still in its relative infancy so let's take a look and see how we've done here okay it doesn't it's uh, I'm not sure if it comes up on screen that visible but that I think that's good enough good enough Okay. So we'll put some uh, of my yellow ground on here, which I do every episode, almost every episode. I'd say maybe out of the 137 paintings that I've made thus far, I'd say maybe Maybe a hundred and fifteen of them have just a warm yellow ground. And if you want to know which warm yellow I'm using, what brand it is, all of that, it's all in the video description below. And I will be using an actual tube of paint to squeeze from here in a moment. In fact, I forgot, I need, let me get some water here. So, just adding a little bit of water to this paint, just to speed up the drying process a little bit. And I say it every time, but this is literally the only time I ever use water when I'm painting with acrylic, is right at the beginning. And if I was just painting by myself, I probably would not use any water. I would just paint it straight on, because Really, the, I'm doing this because there's the urgency of trying to get uh, 
the painting started. The, the, the reason, like ideally what you'd want to be using is maybe like a, a medium, like acrylic painting medium, matte medium, which is, a, which is literally just acrylic paint without any pigment in it. So it's just transparent paint um, because acrylic paint is pigment, which usually comes as a powder, and it's mixed into a medium. And acrylic medium is a lot like white glue. In fact, it often smells very similar to white glue. And um, so acrylic medium is you know, is you can, instead of acrylic medium, you could use an oil-based medium, which is is usually something like linseed oil mixed with pigment, or you might have watercolor, which has, I'm not exactly sure what the binding mechanism or the medium in watercolor is. Um, there's gouache. There's tempera. There's there's even different types of acrylic medium, like, you know, house paint is a, can be, like, latex house paint is a kind of acrylic, but it's intended to kind of take a little bit more wear and tear than acrylic that you might put on your canvas. Okay. Beautiful. <laughs> Donna's listening to the epi to to this episode while driving around. That's cool. <laughs> um, in interesting way to experience a painting class is, is while you're in your car. That is cool. It kind of sounds like something um, that I would have done a couple decades ago when I was making drawings and paintings while driving around in a car. That's all on my... <laughs> those are some of the very first YouTube videos I ever made. Um, when I was in college, I was doing that. That's a whole other story, almost a different different lifetime ago. Okay. So, while this is drying, let's get some paints out onto the, can onto the palette. Just move that out of the way. Okay, so let's start putting some paint on here. So this here, this warm yellow, oh, that sounds, <laughs> it's making, giving me indigestion listening to that sound. Um, so this is the, the actual brand of paint that I use, this Amsterdam Acrylics. Um, it's basically the least expensive and highest grade of paint that that I I've sort of found. I started using this really just because when I was teaching painting in person, and I would have to go out and buy the paint. It's like, okay, what's the cheapest paint? Because I'm paying for it, but paint that's going to make good paintings that people can can hang in their house. It's not just you know cheap paint that uh, you know doesn't have bright colors um, and so this is what I ended up settling on and I've been using it for about well, I don't know, how, eight, eight years I think nine years that I've been doing this oops that's why did I just put so much put way too much of that blue on there uh, so I'll have to figure a way to, <laughs> to use it for today's painting or maybe I can put it back in one of the jars. And I'll put some white in here. And I'm probably not going to use any black. And just like yesterday, we, we painted a space scene. And I only used about a, a tiny little fragment of black at the very, very end. Really, just to demonstrate um, 
you know, uh, how you can, how the, the reason you may want to use black, but I don't think, I'm just going to put that away for right now. Let's. So, it looks like the painting is still a little bit wet. So I'm going to blow dry it. And then let's just take a quick moment to look at Giuseppe Ercomboldo's biography. So I'm going to mute the audio for just a moment so you don't blow your eardrums hearing this. <laughs> Okay, so um, we'll take a look at the biography of this great artist here, um, just so we can have some kind of common ground for, for where we'll talk. So uh, Archimbaldo, or Archimbaldo, or Archimbaldo, uh, was born in Milan, Italy. We don't know exactly the date, so there's a dispute of 1526, 1527 somewhere around then obviously you know back in the day your birthday wasn't as important unless you were a pope or a king or an emperor as uh, Archimbaldo later became the court painter for um, at least one of the Roman emperors and we'll talk about that in a moment um, let me see his father was also an artist. I, I had... Did I return it already? I had a big book of his art here. And it was a book that talked about him and his father. And it was it's kind of really interesting looking at uh, both of those artists side by side in this one book. His father was a much more traditional painter. Obviously, he learned how to paint from his father, uh, which is quite you know that's, that's something in throughout art history is is, is uh, something that's happened many many times most famously Picasso's father was also an artist um, so uh, obviously Archimbaldo the son has exceeded his father in terms of fame and notoriety but uh, you know some people will still consider his father to be the better artist um, uh, so, let me see. Yeah, his father was designing stained glass windows and frescoes for cathedrals, and his son started to apprentice with him um, in learning sort of the family business, I suppose you could say, right? Um, around, let's see, what was the date? He was born 1527. So, you know, what is this? Around 2030 or so, he becomes the, the court painter portrait painter, not painting in these kind of w fantastic wild painting styles, but the court painter uh, in Vienna for Maximilian II, and then later his son Rudolf II. And actually the painting that we're doing today is a portrait of the emperor, uh, the Holy Roman Emperor Rudolf II, painted as Vertumanus, who is the Roman god of the seasons. Right, so he actually did four paintings of in, uh, the sort of cycle of seasons as well. This one is certainly the most famous of all of them. Um, let me see. Yeah, I thought this is funny. Archimbaldo's conventional work has fallen into oblivion. 
<laughs> there's those paintings still exist there's photographs of them in books and and they're in probably some museums probably relegated to storage because most people if they want to see an Archimbaldo want to see the ones that everybody knows uh, so um, you know one of the things I was thinking about you know you know, yes, his paintings were very, very different for his time, but they're not, it's not like they were so different that it got him in trouble with the church and seen as some sort of, like, heretical devil's uh, worship or the hand of the devil or anything like that, which, all joking aside, was could be a serious problem that you could get into at that particular time. Remember, we're, we're only 50 or so years after Galileo has been imprisoned um, and artists like Leonardo are writing things backwards because they're afraid of their journals being confiscated and being accused of crimes against the church for using mirrors and lenses to project images onto the canvas to help speed up the drawing process and get a better likeness. Not too much different than what we've done here using the carbon paper method, right? Um, so there is this kind of general anxiety during this time of of doing things that may offend the church and could get you um, uh, a lengthy prison sentence. So Archimbaldo was never jailed for his work, so it kind of makes it's, it's like okay, that's interesting. His work was definitely very different, but there was something about it that did not elicit the um, the ire of the people in power in the church at the time. So what what made him what made it acceptable to make these very unusual and strange images? Well, there is a kind of a, around this time there's a there's this renaissance fascination with riddles and puzzles and the uh, religious art in general going back to you know three four hundred years prior to this is really interested in symbolism and incorporating very obscure details in the paintings that that refer to historical events or biblical passages and they're sort of this the kind of painting that Archimbaldo does is not too much different from that Right, so some people, their immediate reaction is, well, to paint the emperor and his face is, rather than a sort of so-called realistic face, it looks like a whole bunch of fruit arranged um, to, to create facial details. That must have been hugely insulting. Like that, how... how but, you know, I think in this other... It's, there's actually... If anything, it could be seen as being the opposite. Yes, maybe some people snickered and thought it was very funny and, and strange and weird and it could have caused some titillation. But it was also done as a way of venerating the emperor, uh, the Holy Roman Emperor at the time, um, to because it's associating the emperor with the Roman god Vertuminus, who is you know the is sort of the god of all things right the the god of of food and health and uh like let's just take a quick look at at this like um you know had the the, the vertuminous is like this super super powerful god within the um the the roman pantheon of gods right so by actually painting um, uh, the the emperor, the Holy Roman Emperor, in this way, it was actually a a, a a gesture of veneration, of acknowledging his power and associating him with this ultra powerful uh, Roman god. So I, I thought that was kind of interesting because I I was thinking to myself as I was like. This it work is so different. How did he get away with it? Essentially, because there was, there is a few small examples of artists that were doing kind of weird and different stuff during this period of time, but nothing quite like um, 
what Archimbaldo is doing, and certainly not a court painter, right? But also at the period of time that this artwork is being created, this is at the, you know, I, depending on how you want to think of it, it's the, the, the late Renaissance or the beginning of, or the end of the Renaissance and the beginning of what is called the Mannerist period. And Mannerism is um, sort of the, the art movement. It wasn't really a move, I guess. It was sort of a period of art that was uh, that followed the renaissance and the, rena the the high renaissances you have leonardo da vinci michelangelo raphael donatello and all the other teenage mutant ninja turtles right you, so you have all of these um these artists doing you know this breakthrough of of uh, of, of intellectual approach to, to painting it's followed by a more by mannerism, which is sort of seen as a return to nature and an embrace of of uh, man's connection to the landscape and to all things natural. So it also that also makes real perfect sense to why, again, Archimbaldo making a painting like this, is sort of fits right in to that to that mannerist tradition um, by literally not not just painting paintings of people you know um, frolicking in the landscape but literally becoming vegetables and fruit themselves right so when it so this thing that at first might just seem totally ridiculous the more you start kind of looking into it the more it it has it it makes his work seem like very timely um, and maybe almost the most timely of all, right? So again, it can help kind of invert maybe some assumptions people might have about work at this time. Okay, so let's, um, where should we begin with this painting? So when we look at it, we've got a lot of detail, right? Uh, there's lots of different colors, and that poses a, certainly a challenge. What I'm going to say we do is is we're we're going to mix a whole bunch of colors, and I'm going to just kind of paint in the general shapes of all the colors, kind of like a real quick paint by numbers kind of thing. And then afterwards, what I'll do is glaze some shadows and highlights over top of them. And we'll be able to, we'll probably use just one or two different colors of um, glazing fluid. Like we can mix a purple that we can use a whole bunch of places, mix like a dark blue and a dark red. And we can apply those all over the painting to really quickly create volumes on all of these shapes, right? So, um,. So we again, we're not going to get all the detail in this hyper complex painting. And let's, I just wanted to see one more quick time. What? How big is this painting? Huh? It doesn't list the dimensions there. Let's see, I've got a few other links. Let me see. Uh, five hundred and sixty millimeters by six hundred and eighty millimeters. 56 centimeters. Do I have centimeters on here? Interesting. Okay. So, 56 centimeters high is... Can we get that whole ruler in here? Basically, the length of this ruler. Can you see my thumb down here? So you can't. But basically, it, that painting is, let's see, from top of my head to my belly button, basically. <laughs> right? And then, what did I say? It's, or, oh, that was that's wide. So it's, it's this length wide. We're 680 millimeters, 68 centimeters tall. So I hope this is just a little bit taller than that, right? So it's a fairly fairly large painting um, it's actually 
twice as big than I thought it would be just off of hand, but it also doesn't surprise me, because to be able to get all of that detail that Giuseppe Arcambaldo got in there, um, you would have to have a larger canvas or just be you know, doing a kind of miniature uh, approach to painting, which we're gonna look at in a couple of weeks when we look at some of the art uh, from Pakistan. Um, uh, so let's, maybe it's next week. Things are going so fast. Okay. So where should we begin here? I think let's, there's a lot of green in this painting. So why don't we go down the green, the green path, the path of green. Um, okay. So there's a, uh, just looking at this, he's got, you know, these are some very cool greens here. So it almost looks like he's painted some, almost everything's got a kind of a cool green quality, especially down here on the shoulders and chest area. And then maybe a little bit more warmer greens up in the top of the head. So let's uh, let's just follow his lead. We're gonna follow the master and let's take some cool yellow and some cool blue because this is gonna get us a really nice bright green. Um, the thing is with that is it could be a little intense. So let's put a little bit of white into it. I'm gonna put a bit more yellow in here. And so the reason why I'm putting white, often people think when you put white into the color, it gets brighter. It gets lighter, but it doesn't get brighter. When we, th when we think of like, technically like brighter means more saturation. And every time you put more white into the color, you're actually taking saturation out of it, right? So, um, because white, you're adding a tint to it and it becomes more and more pastel until the point where there's so much white in it that it's just white, right? And there's therefore it has no saturation at all. Okay, maybe let's go to a smaller brush. Okay. So as I said, I'm gonna paint in a bunch of this pretty quickly. Let's use a bigger brush for some of these areas. And the goal is, I think, just for me at this stage, is I just want to occupy the canvas as quickly as possible with as much color as possible and as few fumbling around with details as I can I can manage. So we'll, I'm gonna modify some of these with a little bit of uh, um, different greens. So we'll mix maybe a little bit more yellow, a little bit more blue in as we go. So let's do this again. Let's take some more yellow and mix that in here. And really, even at this point, this is just to help me. I mean, I could just paint a bunch of big, huge block of green down here, but it, I would also lose some of the detail. So by kind of breaking this into slightly different colors, the goal is just to maybe help myself um, identify, I mean, it probably looks pretty close to the same color on the screen there right now. Um, I just want to, it'll make it easier for me and I'm like, oh, okay, so that's one shape. This is a different shape down here. Even if there are virtually the same color. So, 
The other thing too is this canvas, I have a little bit more canvas in the bottom, tops and sides than in his painting just because of um, the, the outline doesn't quite go edge to edge. It's an eight and a half by 11 sheet of paper and this is a nine by 12 canvas, right? So there's not, not everything's gonna, f or there's gonna be a little extra room. So I'm just gonna extend things down. So maybe down here where there's some flowers, uh, which I will bring up here, right? So down here where there's flowers, I'm just gonna put more flowers down here. And so maybe I'll even just extend that a bit there. Let's get even more yellow and also maybe a bit more white on this color for up here. And I'm also, as I paint this, I'm thinking to myself, I may or not do a second coat on some of these colors. I might just paint them like this. And then as I glaze on top of it, that will, will um, give a little bit more, it'll kind of cover up maybe any of the the thin areas of paint. But I can guarantee you that Archimbaldo probably used this exact method, probably not a yellow like I did, probably a little bit more of a brown, but you can see that there is this almost yellow color coming through everywhere in this painting. Like in the, like in fact, let's just take a second just so you don't think I'm making it up as I go along. <laughs> Right, if we look through the paint here, I don't know if this is wood, the wood color where it's kind of cracked, but you could see there's kind of a brownish orange under everything. Can you see all this here? Right, where it's even where it's kind of looks like it's been scraped, you can see it right underneath this dark area here. Right, so all of this this color i'm using yes we could have used maybe something a little bit closer to the original but i've talked about this many many times before um the reason why i use this uh warm yellow as opposed to making a brown and it's really for for all those new people it's just to save some time right because if i'm using this warm yellow we squish it out of the tube paint it we've got a, a, a primed canvas ready to go and we're not fussing with making a, a brown you know it, surely you can buy brown and there's many artists that do but if you know anything again with me i like to mix all of the colors from this very simple six color split complementary palette right split comp complementary just means two yellows, two reds, two blues, and one of each is, one's a warm and one's a cold, right? Um, and if all of this sounds like confusing and new, remember I did a whole 45 episode long intro to painting series. The link is in the description below if you wanna watch those episodes. And I, again, in January, I'm gonna start that all up again and we're going to kind of because I've, as I've been painting for 137 episodes, there's been, I'm like, oh, you know what? If I was to do this over again, then I'd probably teach those introductory classes just slightly different. So I'm going to do that. I'm going to take that opportunity to, to sort of try to get that experience, that first few episodes uh, for people done in a way that um, that lines up with, with everything that I've learned over the past year. Because even teachers learn things, right? I mean, hopefully. <laughs> hopefully teachers, as they teach, you know, grow and develop. And um, I'm certainly not the same teacher I was when I first started teaching many, many years ago. Okay, so let's, um, let's look at these grapes. 
Now these grapes are a little bit more, that, that's a warm green actually. So I was about to paint it here and then show you what I was gonna do, but you know what, before I, I'm gonna, I'm gonna mix a separate color for that. So let's just keep on going. Sorry, anybody who was on grape watch, uh, we'll just have to keep watching for the grapes. Just like when we painted the Botero painting and we had Skeleton Watch 2021, right? Same things, we're, we're on Grape Watch 2021. <laughs> um, okay, and again, I'm just painting these in really quick. I'm not really concerned with how sloppy all of this looks because I just wanna get as many colors on here and then, then we're gonna outline or put in the negative space, this dark color in the background. And then we can kind of be a little bit more loose on top of it. Anywhere else that needs, you tell me, where else do you think I need more color? More green. And you know, if I miss a few things here and there, that's okay. You know, there might be a few little tiny leaves, but that might just be easy and, and like stems and all that stuff. That'll be easier to do later. Okay, so I think I'm done with the cool green for right now. I'm gonna mispronounce your name. I apologize because I've never seen a name spelt this way. So, so how how do you say your name? Wyo Gabriel de Novaes. Is that, I'm not, that's a such an interesting name. Yoel Yo Yoel Gabriel de no, Novaes says a level 80 teacher. I I hope is that is that a good thing? <laughs> level 80. Um, uh, I mean, I, th I th I'm I'm going to take that as a compliment. <laughs> you can tell me if it's a uh, um, if the best teachers are level one or a hundred or eighty or uh, so. <laughs> um. Maria says, hi people, this one makes me especially happy since I'm a vegetarian myself. Oh yeah, I forgot. So today is uh, v World Vegetarian Day or International Vegetarian Day. Um, I'm a vegetarian myself and my wife's a vegetarian. And uh, for anyone worried that you're going to, you're not going to feel full enough or you're always going to be hungry or you'll lose too much weight, I can tell you that uh, I'm doing very well. Very, very healthy, rotund man. <laughs> that uh, um, there's plenty of, of delicious food out there that is plant-based. Uh, <laughs> so let's take some warm yellow and warm blue. We'll mix this together. And obviously you can see we get a very different green, right? And part of the reason is, you know, when we had, we made this green, we're using cool blue and cool yellow, and they're right next to one another on the color wheel. So we're gonna get a highly saturated color. On the other hand, when we mix the warm yellow and warm blue together, they, they gotta go for a much longer walk around the color wheel to get to one another. In fact, they don't go for a walk around, they go the short way across, and they're starting to get close to what we call the neutral core. And as things get closer to the center of your palette, they lose saturation, right? So we could make a very similar cool yellow, but it would involve adding some red on the other side and it's gonna pull it towards the middle, become more brown. And we'll, we'll probably do that in today's episode anyway. So now let's take this, that's actually maybe a little bit too dark, so let's lighten it up. And maybe I'm just 
going to shift down to a different brush here. Oh, that's, I think I want to be higher. There's going to be lots of uh, little changes that are, that are made here where I try to figure out where things go. And there's probably going to be some fruit that's going to get lost in the shuffle. And I don't feel like I need to, to do every little thing in here. So you can see I can kind of be a little playful the top of this painting is kind of cut out, so let's put that. Um, do we have any? Let's use some of this. I'm just going to put this down here as well. Oh, that was supposed to be a darker color, and this is where they're supposed to go. That's okay. All these grapes. Let's, uh, even though these aren't green completely let's I'm gonna put this in here I'm a little I don't want it to be just all cool green on the bottom here and we can we'll add other colors over top of it that green we can lighten that up let's this mustache here I have the least green thumb of anyone I know so not only am I very poor at caring for plants <laughs> but I am um, uh, miserable at recognizing what what plants are what I did, actually I did scan something from one of the books I had on Archimbaldo that uh, I think with this painting kind of pointed out what everything is in here. One of the really interesting things is how different vegetables and fruits have changed over the past couple hundred years. Like. It's it's really interesting. I mean, if you look up like what bananas used to look like, you know, um, they're very different than the bananas we get today, right? In almost every single case, every sort of fruit and vegetable you can get at the grocery store is radically different than what they used to look like, because you know, like water seedless watermelons might be an example. Like obviously. You know, nature would not make a seedless watermelon. It doesn't make any sense because the whole purpose of a, of any kind of fruit and vegetable is to carry the the well, not every vegetable, but at least every fruit, for instance, or maybe not every fruit, but a lot of them have seeds inside, and the the idea is for that seed to go somewhere else, fall on the ground, and sprout another tree or something, right? So, a seedless watermelon makes no sense from like a. Uh, is a biological perspective or bot 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 botanical perspective? <laughs> I don't know. Um, so, um, 
So humans have like modified, and this is long before genetic modification, just through um, you know selective breeding of different plants, modified them to amplify them to become more tasty, to grow faster, to be you know more pleasing in terms of shape and color and all that kind of stuff. So what is kind of interesting about a painting like this, if we were to talk to like a, a specialist who, who who would they might be able to recognize certain things here and be like, oh wow yeah that's what an onion used to look like 500 years ago, right? Like who knows like you could if someone told me that uh, these things on his cheeks there were what an onion used to look like, even though I think this is an onion down here. Um, I'd be like, yeah, that's entirely possible, yeah. So, um, Maria says, I don't have any sound. No sound, is it just me? Um, yeah, so it looks like maybe she's got it fixed there. Okay, good, good. Um, <laughs> Lolly says, I'm a fellow vegan, and so this guy in the painting looks like my perfect dinner. <laughs> Marie says, hi, Michael. If you see this and find time to answer, what does it mean to put your feelings on a painting? Sometimes I start painting without any ideas, and it turns out something very childish. Do you know what I mean? Interesting. Um, what? I'm not, maybe not sure exactly what you mean, because it almost sounds like there's a couple different questions in there. What does it mean to put your feelings on a painting and... Sometimes you start with a, a painting without any ideas and it turns out very childish. Hmm. Um... I'll have to think about that. Maybe while I'm painting here, I'll, I'll see how I can answer that. So maybe w before I, I, I launch into that, let's just get a little bit more done here. So let's paint some red, I think. We've got enough kind of green in here. So let's paint some warmer reds. So I'm going to take this warm red. Now, even though there's some bright red areas in here, I'm gonna, just going to start out with something maybe a little bit more orangey and a little bit of white let's get a little more yellow in here okay. and just the reason why I'm doing that is red can often seem just like super intense and bright and um, I'd rather build up to that level of saturation rather than just launch, put it right down right now because it's so intense. It might be nice to, to you know, it's like a, what would it be like? It's sort of like an ace of, uh, of hearts or something. Ace of spades in your, your poker hand, even though I don't play. <laughs> I don't gamble, I don't play any kind of um, card games really these days, I, although I have a few times and people don't like playing with me because I often win even though I don't know what I'm doing, which outrages them, so I don't get invited to many poker nights with my friends anymore because no one wants to play with me because I don't know what I'm doing and yet I seem to win. <laughs> <laughs> Which, if you're like, uh, if you, I guess, if you play cards, it would be a really infuriating thing, right? And you know, people having to explain the rules to me, and even though I've been, I've played it many times, I still, I just have never bothered to, to properly learn any of those things. Which again frustrates people, understandably. And also, when I've played poker, I just I like to just play fast. I'm just like, oh, okay, let's just bet everything right here. And then sometimes I win, and then I win everything. Or sometimes I'm out 20 minutes into the night, 
and then I gotta sit here and, and watch everybody play for four hours and so um I don't know why he started talking about that but um okay let's just keep on I'm just gonna put more of these colors down here we'll modify things as we go as needed Okay, I was like, what is going on? I feel like there's a whole bunch of missing... Um, and I'm like, yeah, we're, we're a little bit too zoomed in here. On this image. Let's bring it back here. Purple. I'm going to paint this pink, and then we can make it purple later. So all of this stuff that I'm painting down here isn't even in his painting, because that painting sort of cuts off right down here, right? what this line is intended to be but uh, yeah let me see should I put well, let's, maybe I'll paint that and then I'll see if I want to do any kind of flowers or something in there um, let's take some color things up there and even though this is going to be purple I'm just gonna paint it red right now just for fun okay I think that's pretty good so now let's go to let's make a let's make Maybe I'm just going to take a bunch of white, mix this together. We've got some white in here. Anything else that needs white? Very dirty purple because it's um, it's just I just threw some blue into my warm red, so it's going to be much more of like a brown. Okay. Um, maybe so. Let's let's make a a brown, more of an actual brown here. So let's take. Our, our uh, yellow, warm yellow, warm red, and warm brown. And then 
then let's just put this. That's still very red. That's okay. Notice how, like, I just want to get everything painted, like, just fill it all up so we can get this beginning part of the process finished with these eyes. Obviously, I'm going to put something else in here. I'm just going to paint in some brown in there. Maybe this will be sort of just like my, my color to to fill up areas with. So these are these, uh, what is it, like wheat things sticking out here. I want to sort of get a little bit of a darker Part underneath and then they'll be much brighter on top Supposed to be maybe green. Let's put that there. Same thing. I'm gonna put this brown down here. And just out of for balance, I'm just gonna do a little bit on that side. Um, this is gonna be purples and. Okay. Under here. I think that's good. There's a lot of <laughs> comments here. Um, I'll get to all that in a moment. Let's let's uh, make some purple here. So to get a bit more of a purpley quality, let's take some warm red and warm blue we'll mix this together and we get a purple beautiful purple i'm just going to put a bit of white into it because otherwise that purple might just look really really dark on here Obviously, we want to build up to that darkness. We want to have some dark grapes and all that kind of stuff, but not quite there yet, so...
Okay. Just kind of took a bunch of white and mixed it in here. Okay, I think that's... That's good enough, right? Okay. Just wipe off all this excess paint. Okay, so just let me see if I can look at all these. Um, well, this is Maria. I wonder if Childish you mentioned is just part of your own style? Just have a childish vibe in your painting style. It's not a bad thing to have your style. Uh, Lolly says, I wish I could figure out my own signature style other than just messy. Marie says, I don't think I have a style. Maybe I'm just a confused beginner. Or beginner, Lolly says, maybe our beginner paintings just kind of come off as a little bit childish. I expect that to disappear with more practice. Heidi says, wow, Michael, you are like Rain Man. It's a gift. We had a relative who was banned from casinos in Las Vegas because he won so easily. It was the late husband of my husband's... It was the late husband of my husband's aunt, the German, a German-American. Interesting. I don't know if I'm like Rain Man with my winning at poker or anything. Um... Although I have I have played with a few friends and won money, which again it makes them even more angry. When you don't know what you're doing and you win all the money that people put in, like a hundred bucks, I just went and just bought everyone some ordered some pizzas and stuff. I was like, I, what am I going to do with all this money? Um, um, the thing is, as a child, I was always into dueling around and coloring, but as I grew older, this passion was dismissed by my family and friends. Uh, I was no artist, just a creative kid, so I lost uh, myself and studied different things. I think I may be trying unconsciously to go back there and try again. Yes, that your story of of uh, not really being encouraged by the people around you to to make art is unfortunately a, a really really common um, thing that happens to kids. Um, I remember, I've, and I've said it here before, that I had uh, one of my one of my great friends when I was in art school, an undergrad, said, "I'm I'm an artist just because my mom just kept hanging my drawings on the fridge," and I was just like, "Oh, I guess I'm good at this," and I really think a big part of of making art is just being getting you know, some encouragement. And with that kind of encouragement, even if it's just some kind of blind support from your, your parents, you just want to keep on doing it. And, and versus other kids, they're not getting any sort of encouragement, so they just think they must be doing something wrong. Maybe their parents want them to do something else, so they're just sort of gently kind of back off the encouraging the art thing where they don't really have any understanding of art themselves, so they just, they don't even, so I, don't, I don't think even most people are doing out of any malice, or they're just, like, I mean, I used to teach little kids all the time, and it would be really interesting watching parents come to pick their kids up after class, and, you know, generally little kids are super excited about making art, and so you'd see some kids like, oh, look, I made this thing. And it's just a big blob of clay. And their parents are like, oh, wow, that's so cool. Tell me all about it. And the kid's talking about it. And you can see how excited and proud they are of it. And then other parents would come and pick up their kids. And they're like, look, Mom, I made this thing. And they're like, okay, that's great. Let's go. we got to go pick up your sister. And... 
you can tell even just the way the parent's holding it that they're just like, how long do I have to hold on to this piece of junk before I can throw it out kind of thing? Will anybody, will this child of mine notice if it's, if we throw it out before we even get to the car kind of thing? And you're like, oh man, that's so sad. Uh. And then it, what's really sad is, is I've worked with kids, I've, I've worked in, in like whole schools with kids as like a artist in residence. Um, and you'll see kind of as kids get older, less and less kids are still making art. And even though they're all basically at the same level, you'll go into a classroom and and at grade two, everyone's still excited about making art. It's their favorite class. In grade three, my, my favorite age is like grades three and four usually. But even around grade three, you go into that classroom. Or grade, grade four, especially by grade five, there's... By grade five, like, I mean, it has obviously stuff to do with puberty and getting older and, and being more conscious of others but that you often find like ever, all of a sudden kids are very self-conscious about making art there might be one or two kids in the class that are the artists right and everyone else is you know even though everyone else is at the same level basically as everyone else it's not like but they just, they'll look at their drawing and be like, oh, how do I, this is, my drawing is really bad. Like, how do I make it better? I'm like, it looks great. What are you talking about? It's fine. Oh, no, it's, I'm not, I'm no good. I'm not really good at making art. Like, who's, and I'm like, who's telling you these things? Ugh. Yeah, my, it's often because, oh, uh, my parents are, want me to play music, or my parents want me to be, my dad wants me to play baseball. And so kids are going to do, our daughter is crying upstairs, speaking of, of kids. Um, but kids will generally sort of try to do something that's going to please their parents to get some positive reaction out of them and if parents aren't giving them a positive reaction for the art they're making then why would they continue doing it right so yeah it's a, it, as far as I'm concerned it's a huge tragedy and just to think of like all of the potentially genius artists that you know never made art again even though they might have just had some innate ability So that's why I tend to try to be as effusive with my praise. It's not just out of some um, uh, like pandering or being condescending or not condescending. Um, what's the word? Patronizing. It's um, because I think anybody doing anything creative is an achievement. Or like because the vast majority of people won't do this kind of thing in their spare time. They'd rather just consume rather than produce, right? Okay. And just to go back to one of your last things, Marie says, yes, I do think you're probably both unconsciously and now consciously trying to, to get back to that point in your life where you did really like making art and now you're older and you can make some of those decisions for yourself and you're like, yeah, I, I enjoyed doing that. I'm going to go back and do that. <laughs> um, okay. So this right now we're, you know, we've been painting for about an hour and we've got a great foundation for a painting. So this would be a natural place for you to to pause and 
if you wanted to stop painting for today and, and come back tomorrow or next week after everything's dried and pick it up and finish it, that would be a perfect place. If you wanted to switch from acrylics, which we did this, into oil paint, that's what many artists would do as well. Obviously, you'd want to make sure this is nice and dry, probably let it dry overnight, and then pa paint some oil over top of it. Uh, I'm going to just keep on going until I finish it, which should probably be at maybe two hours from now. Um, uh, and, and we'll see how things turn out, right? So, uh, um, there's Ari Graham says, this is so wonderful. Thanks for doing this. Welcome, Ari or Ari. I'm not sure how we pronounce your name, but, uh, yeah, come join us every Tuesday and Thursday, and obviously you hear I'm on a Friday, but Tuesdays and Thursdays at 4 o'clock Pacific time, I'm painting every day, so hit that subscribe button so that you can follow along and paint with me at least twice a week. Um, so we're, what should we do next here as I'm thinking about this? Let's look at the painting again. So, uh, probably what I'm going to do next is start working into the shadows. So, there's lots of different ways to go about this. Now, the, the slower, more deliberate way, if we had months to paint on this painting, what I would do is mix individual colors for all of these um, different fruits and vegetables and then apply um, some darker gradients and lighter gradients for shadows and highlights. Because I'm, a, I'm limited for time, I'm going to radically reduce the colors that I use to modify what I already have down here. And that's going to mean that I'm going to obviously lose a certain amount of detail in the painting. There's just by, because I'm essentially cutting corners. I'm, I'm cutting, uh, I'm, I'm going to cut corners dramatically here, but it's not going to, it's still, we're still going to get, I think, a, a painting that we're going to be pretty happy with. But, um, um, like, maybe, like, maybe I could do a little bit Maybe I'll, I'll do, in fact, okay, that's, let's, I'll, I'll, I'll do a little bit painting how you could do this entire painting, which would mean you could be painting for at, at least 10, 12 hours on this, and then I'll, I'll, then I'll do the, the faster version of it, just so you can see, okay, well, maybe I'll, I'll just do the, I'm, I got lots of time, I'm retired, I'll just gonna, yeah, I'll, I'll take this, I need something to keep me busy maybe maybe that's you right so let's um where should we which one should we do let's do maybe i'll do let's do a green up here and at this point i'll probably start using uh the glazing fluid as well. So this is what I'll, I'll be using for a lot of the painting. I'll be mixing glazing fluid into my acrylic. And this is like a game changer when it comes for painting with acrylic. If you don't have some glazing fluid, then you're, you're very limited with the types of painting that you can make. You're more or less likely to only be able to paint maybe paintings like impressionist paintings, Van Gogh type of paintings, kind of paintings that are done very quickly, which, you know, is maybe what a lot of people want to do. And we've done, in the description below, we've painted, we did a whole Van Gogh week, right? We did, uh, we've explored Claude Monet and who are, um, Berta Morisot, uh, Mary Cassatt. I'm sure there's more Impressionist painters than that we've covered. Anyway, um, so you can, and basically just because Impressionist painters are painting very quickly, so it's, they're not using a uh, layering method, it's it's just wet on wet painting, right? 
where you're painting wet paint on wet paint, it's, it's developing quite quickly. At least in, in the traditional kind of acrylic or uh, uh, impressionist style. So if you don't have glazing fluid, you you have to basically paint in that method um, where your brush strokes are very visible, right? Um, like Van Gogh, right? Where there's there's little to no blending whatsoever, unless you're blending with wet paint and you're painting kind of thickly. If you're using glazing fluid, then you can do every other kind of, of style and approach to painting that is that artists have used over the past 500 years which unlocks just so much m more opportunities and a bottle of glazing fluid I think this is probably like 20 bucks maybe 20 somewhere between let's say 17 to 30 dollars depending on your art supply store so and it sounds like a lot but you know one of I think I've this is a newer bottle I bought a f maybe a month ago but prior to that, I think I probably did about 80 paintings with one bottle, right? So, because it's not like you're squeezing all of it out. You can see how much I put on here. Anyway, let's, we're going to modify this. So let's take a little bit of some darker, some warm blue. Let's mix it into this yellow here. Oops, sorry. So I'm just trying to get like a darker green. And I'm going to start... The other thing I want to do is start from the... From the things that are furthest away, the things that are being um, layered upon, rather than start with the things that are on top. Because I'll slowly start layering on top of things. So, I'll, as I'll, you'll see here in a moment, I think I'm going to start right here in the forehead. <laughs> okay. So, the, the reason why I want to start here is that as I keep painting, I'm going to overlap shapes on top of shapes. So, for instance, let's... Uh, Take this. I can't see any of these pencil lines that were there. So I'm just going to kind of do this star pattern in here. And then I'm going to kind of just create a bit of a shadow from the things that are above it. And we, we don't know exactly what all of these shapes might be yet so we want to try to just very simple kind of general shadow let's go to a smaller Right. The other the great thing with the glazing fluid, like you just saw, if I'm not happy with it because it takes longer for it to dry, I can literally just smudge that right out and move it out of the way. Versus if I painted it with just straight on acrylic right out of the tube, it's not going to just brush away with my finger or a rag quite so easily. Um, you know, I've got this... So let's, I'm just going to take some of the same paint and just kind of go around. And 
And we'll just, I'll, I'll use it up maybe while I'm right here, so. So this is just using this green glaze that I've got. And I can paint it on top of the cool colors, the cool greens. I mean, I can paint it on top of the reds and the purples and everything else as well. Um, which is one of the fun things about using a glaze. Uh, let me see if there's a place I can... Let's just, let's just, so you can see that I can do this. All right, let's paint right here on the nose with this green glaze. So you don't have to use green glaze on the green shapes, you can use green glaze on on here are these red things here and let's just do a little more of it if anything I would it's kind of nice to use lots of different colors on different uh, and glaze on top of different shapes because then you're gonna have lots of variety of colors and I think it'll, it'll actually be ultimately way more satisfying So here's these red, I don't know what these things are, little radishes or something. So it's, you know, they're very lightly painted in here, and that's part of what the whole glazing process is. You know, it's a little bit slow and time consuming, but this is a great way of just starting to kind of add some shape into here. Right, we painted all of this stuff and it was just sort of this kind of mishmash of colors and it just looked a little sloppy and now we're kind of starting to customize it a bit. Now remember the light is coming from the left hand side. So we'll have highlights on this side and then the darker gets darker on the right hand side of all of the fruits and vegetables. Alright, let's do some of this green even right on top of this purple. And I'm still gonna do a paint the background a, a second time once I sort of just get a little bit more of uh, just some shapes created here so how about let's uh, let's go into the grapes and let's start we can just out of random just start painting some circles here So I'm, at first I'm just going to put some circles next to circles and then I'm going to put some circles in behind some circles. I'm going to start building up this layering effect. And I, I'm not looking at the original trying to see if I've got the right circles in the right place. I could really care less. Right? I'm, that's not what why I'm painting this painting, is to make sure I've got all 27 green grapes in here. Okay. 
Okay. That is, but I'm just gonna make it dark again. I'm gonna paint on this here, make it a little darker green. It's a little tiny. I'll probably do that as in a different way. Where else can we move to? This spiky thing. Let's just start kind of playing with it, just adding. Bikes, just so we know it's there. Uh, this bushel. We'll do that with a different color. Okay. make this no, I'm just gonna uh, let's do I guess I'll do two sh two shapes here and convert this into two one in behind the other like that All right so this is this area here again First of all, like the the colors don't have to be all r exactly the same anyway. But even at this point, I can still change all these colors quite dramatically later on if I want to. Um, Let's move this up a little bit. So the point really at this here is just to start pulling out individual shapes out of this big mess of lines or, or color that we've just quickly thrown together, right? It's not about finishing everything, it's just giving some definition. I think, you know, if you're skeptical, then just pause the video go have some dinner or lunch breakfast wherever you are on beautiful planet earth or maybe you're watching this a couple hundred years from now and you're on a different planet um hopefully they still have paint in the future um but uh you know go just then skip to the very end and take a look and if you think if you like the way it turns out then and jump back to where we are right now and just watch from here. Let's see. I'm going to just mix a bit more. I like how this is the the this choice of the of a darker green is working out. This is just warm yellow and warm blue and just a little bit more with the warm blue, this ultramarine blue. That's actually a little bit of a darker mixture which is totally fine because we're kind of starting to move down towards the bottom of this canvas. Right, you see this is this is what I'm working on right here. And I'm just going to I'm sort of like Gonna enlarge some of the, what is this? Is this a um, 
artichoke? I think. Again, since fruits and vegetables have, have changed over the past 500 years, if someone was to tell me this is a, uh, maybe not a coconut, but a, or a pineapple or something, I'd be like, really? Like you could, I, I wouldn't be at all surprised if it was something very recognizable that has changed so radically. Like if people said, this is what peanuts used to look like, and then they just bred them into something totally different. I'd be like, wow, that's, that's wouldn't surprise me. Oh, there was a big leaf here. Should I bring that leaf back? No. Maybe I'll leave that leaf out. So what should we do next? this area. Let's take this darker color. See how we can just start shaping out all of these different things? I just think it's so cool. Um, let's see. Now, all of this down here, that's a lot of detail. What is this, like a cabbage or something? Hmm. I guess we... I'm just gonna, again, just be pretty fast and loose here.
So I'm just, the idea is just to quickly describe what these shapes are gonna be. And then as I come back here, I'll try to create something a little more believable in that space. So I'm in this zone here. For all these flowers, I think I um, probably won't use a green. I might use a little bit something a little bit different, a purple perhaps, to do that. Oh, I see some more grapes that I think I missed right here. Grapes, let's kind of start. supposed to be a darker purple and now I'm just really I, I made that thing and didn't fix it later on do I want to fix it should I fix it I don't mind it like that I can always turn these into purple grapes later So how about let's just zoom out. Um, okay. So what, we've been painting for about an hour and a half and this is where we're at. That's great. I'm actually quite pleased that we're here. Because we're... We're running pretty good with time, considering how complex this painting is. And that we've gotten this far makes me really happy. Um, so I think maybe at this stage I'm gonna finish the background I'm gonna go over it one more time with a, uh, a, a the darkest color we can mix with the paints again I would strongly recommend not using black even if you do want to use black elsewhere in here I would paint this with the with like the kind of mixture I'm going to do right here which is some warm blue and warm red To get a really nice dark color. Let's take some warm yellow and put this in here too. This is gonna look awfully like a black. Black enough for for most people. And uh, yet if I do end up using black anywhere else in the picture, um, this because it's in the background will still seem further away because otherwise any black will want to sit right on the front of the canvas so I don't want to put something really really uh, I don't want to I don't want the background to leap in front of the foreground And I'm just sort of going in here. And now I could start kind of like shaping these grapes, for instance. So maybe let's zoom in so you can see what I'm up to.
you can see how I'm using two brushes. I've got a big brush to kind of smooth things away. And then I'm using a small brush to get into these details. That way I can kind of clean up things as I go. So I, I can avoid building up big areas of texture. And often like the area right around here can often feel like can get really thin with paint because I'm probably using less paint as I'm as I'm going in and outlining these details right so having a bigger brush to kind of just go back around is really helpful I don't think I'm explaining that very well Not even sure what this is going to be here with these little cherries or apples. I don't know. I keep adjusting that shape. Oh, these were. I don't know what this was supposed to be. To, to do the grape shapes. Also, you know, if I want, I can always just, if, I, if I'm if i not happy with where some of this black is, I can just paint some white over top of it and then paint any other color back over top of that. As I'll, I'll do here with a few things shortly, like flowers that are coming back into this area. But. Right, so after I've kind of gone into here, then I can just take my brush, my bigger brush, and just smooth out these areas where I was really kind of picking in and around these edges. I don't know what the best analogy for this is, but it makes me think of like, um, somebody mowing the lawn and then somebody you know using a little trimmer to clean up around where the lawnmower can't quite get to maybe yeah maybe that makes sense so it's like um you know when you mow the lawn you can't your lawnmower can't get into all of the tight corners and uh, you know next to the flower bed or by the sidewalk so you often use like a, what do they call those things? Oh, was it a weed whacker? What was that, that machine called? 
It's like a, yeah, the spinning thing with the plastic like fishing wire in there that would whip around and you could get a little bit closer detailing. I think it's the same sort of thing with like a lawnmower. Like with, with my lawnmower is the big brush that I can use to lay in color really quickly. And then the weed whacker is the one where I can come in and just trim in here. And it's sort of, I use, it's like if I was running a landscaping crew, I'd have them kind of going one following the other, right? And sometimes somebody does a little bit of trimming and then the big lawnmower just comes and cleans all that up and vice versa. You guys are talking about being vegetarians. Just uh, <laughs> you guys are chatty in the group today. The last few last few episodes have been. Which is great. I love it. I love all of, all of the conversation that arises out of there. Uh, I just <laughs> it goes by sometimes so quickly. Um, I can't read it all. Okay, so uh, what should we do now? So you can see like it it goes in these kind of waves of evolution, right? We started. It just was just plopping color in here, almost appearing at random, and then we started shaping it with some of that green. Um, we could keep on doing that. I think I'm just going to go, this is the little bit more of the, how I might cut some corners. So instead of using the exact color to, to add some definition to each object, what I'm going to do here is glaze with my darkest color. All right. So glazing, you know, if you could do this with black, I guess. But again, I would strongly discourage it, but um, uh, because at least this has got a little bit more color and it's not quite so harsh. Um, and so now I can, I'm going to go in. Maybe I'll do the the purple grapes first. So let's zoom in. these beautiful details I love it uh, I'm gonna start on this side here so again let's just start out with maybe some side by side and then we'll put some kind of being that are in a little bit in behind Stay with the. I'll just stay on track here with the grapes, but um, oops, my background isn't dry. And just put my hand in the background color. So
some dark eyes in there. This glazing fluid on here. Let's start kind of shaping things even more. It's interesting how it looks like on the television monitor. Looks a little different than it does. It looks quite different than it does here on my screen, but. Let's just keep on plowing ahead here. So one of the benefits of using this glazing fluid too is because it's a little bit more transparent, I don't it's not like I'm obliterating the the color that was there. If I was just painting black or dark color over top of, let's say, these reds or greens or purples, then it would just be a different color sitting right on top. Whereas with any of these, I also have the opportunity to kind of smudge them and blend them. Just give them a little bit of a little bit more uh, rendering to them. So, how let's do... these clumps. can just darken certain things. We don't really know what they are or were. There's a sort of 
disappear a little bit in the background. Okay. Let's maybe come right back to the middle just for a moment. trying to describe like the little peas in these pods here. So I'll put some highlights on that. supposed to be up here on more of these so we'll take care of that I'll be a little bit different approach we'll do that kind of once we get a little bit further along up here and you know what, honestly, I would, as as I'm working on this, I'm, the way that uh, Archambaldo would have painted this painting is, is pretty similar to what we're doing right now. Like, I, I, I would just kind of struggle to think of, like, how he would approach this painting any differently than what we're doing here. Like, he absolutely would have used these same techniques. This is the very traditional way of painting that he would have learned from his father, who was a, a, an accomplished painter in his own right, or, although largely forgotten by this point, by, by today's standards. Obviously, I mean, you could, you can, his paint, his father's painting still exists, and, you know, I'm sure they're they come up in auction every once in a while. Um, Cause most of them are probably in private hands, people who don't even really know what they 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 own. Because they're not really they're pretty You know, just, you know, fairly standard paintings of typical religious scenes, biblical scenes that are being um, illustrated. Okay.
So in this area, there'll be a lot of dark, we'll probably do a lot of shadowing in here too. Or highlights, I mean, sorry. I mean, this is, all of this detail in this, again, I don't know what this, these kind of cabbage leaves or whatever, is really cool. Like, I, this would be, it's almost something like we would study this and do, uh, like, a whole episode just working on, on this particular kind of uh, structure. So... I'm just gonna, I'm taking the kind of lazy approach here is just to quickly make it look like there's something here, I guess. your mop brush for this but sometimes it's just as easy just to use your fingertips I think we'll if we start to, uh, sh should I get that f these flowers maybe this one I might be able to start doing sort of didn't quite uh, do this properly so I'm just gonna make another put another flower right here Basically, it's like I'm glazing with gray or something, right? And then I can just go in and uh, outline things. Like, he probably would have spent whole day just painting this little flower here and I'm trying to get it done in about 30 seconds right so it's not obviously there's going to be a few things missing here and I'm just just for the sake of getting this painting done in a timely manner, I'll probably, I'm, I'm just gonna, I don't have time to really examine all of these flowers and their shapes. It 
so I might repeat the same flower here a few times. That. What was I going to do here? Wait, I think I'm going to take some pure white. I didn't even wash my brush or anything. I just dipped it right in here because I don't mind if I get colors are so-called contaminated a little bit. Maybe I'm going to come back down here. Just add a bit of white into this little flower. was up in his eyes. I'm just going to put these. Maybe that's a little harsh. Um,
So we'll change the shape of that as we once we go here. I just want to get it in. Got a little bigger than I was planning on, but it's okay. Let's uh, zoom back out and just take a little inventory of where things are, what needs to be done. Before I do all of these little details in there, I want to get this closer to being finished. Let's, uh... Anything else while I'm down here? I got color on. This is just like a light color, and kind of a light, so it's kind of my warm green with some white in here. I'm going to glaze with it a little bit. So I'm kind of like, I can soften out some of these edges. Or, or by adding a little bit of highlights here, I can go over some of the darker lines. Remember, the light is coming from the left.
I'm just going to get a bit of warm blue in here to this white. Building up little highlights wherever possible. You can, and I like to kind of just mix and match little highlights here and there because it's also just going to complicate some of these shapes. should zoom in now obviously things look kind of bright right now color wise we can um, we can certainly significantly uh, reduce the the highlight the the brightness of the painting by just continuing to darken things right we just kind of started with just our local color So as this, the uh, the light, you know, this form. So I back this out just to describe. So we have this kind of round shape here, right? Most of this side is going to get the light, whereas this side is going to get most of the shadow. So we're only going to have a few little highlights on this side, and most of the rest of it is going to be kind of covered in shadow. Thank you. 
I'm going to make a orange and put it in for a few carrots and things. So taking some warm yellow, a little bit of warm red. I'll take some white because, oops. I'm going to go over a bit of the background to do this. Little bits of orange everywhere. Um, let's get some on this corn. that and darken that later but that's pretty good for right now okay everything's coming along I think am I ready to start doing some of this wheat so to do the wheat I've just got warm yellow and some white might be a little bit of warm red still on there, making it a bit of orangey, but that's okay. So, let's do the right side, I think, first.
Now I might go back, I probably will, and just sort of darken and maybe brighten some of this up a little bit. In fact, let's just do one a little bit further in the background. This is just warm yellow on its own, maybe a bit of glazing fluid. I didn't wash my brush or anything either, just to try to get that a little bit there. And then I can just, well, we'll, we'll do that. I'll wait for that to dry a little bit. Um... I'm going to take this area and I'm just going to start putting in some little dots. These are kind of just orangey spots here. Not as bright as I will eventually go, but I want to kind of have a few layers of this. Kind of looks like a beardy kind of thing, right? Let's go up to the top here. Now I'm going to go over that and, and have some brighter uh, areas as well. I'm just going to kind of go in quickly to get that in position. So let's do... I'm just going to use the same, it's kind of tricky, it's easier to do it, whichever way you find easier to do this, to, to either pull it towards you or away from you, so I'm just going to flip the canvas around to get at it.
not near done yet, but slowly making our way there, right? Oh, there we go. So, um, these carrots, I'll put a little highlight on one side here. Cold red. I think this is really the first time I've used cold red in this painting thus far. details too with the color like that. some cold red purpley color in some of these uh, red shapes in there in the shadows I should put a bit of glazing fluid just so it does this a little bit smoother this brown not really sure what's here and I don't know if I need to really completely define it Like, I'd like to be done within the next hour, so, um, and there's just a lot of, a lot of detail that I don't think I'll be able to get to, so I'm just going to keep on plowing ahead. In fact, let's zoom in and start doing some of these grapes. So, I'm sort of going on to the 
onto one side of the grapes to get the to darken them because one side is going to have shadows and one side's going to have highlights, right? Likewise, just before I kind of take some of this purple and just go into the shadow a bit. I love taking colors and just sort of adding lots of color into the shadow so that we have a lot of variety of something else there as we go. So this is just like some warm blue. Maybe I'm just going to get a bit of a bigger brush or some of this. I'm just taking some warm blue with some glaze. I'm just, I finally use a little bit of my mop brush, which I've, I haven't used throughout the painting yet. I often, if I I have a few more mop brushes that I've ordered on the way, but uh, you can see I, I, at first I often will just use my finger to do a lot of smudging because it doesn't really matter earlier on in the painting stages. But as I get closer to being done, then I start to because I don't want to use up my mop brush and have it all kind of you know crunchy with lots of different paints all dried in there earlier on 
and then it's sort of semi-useless by the when I really need it to do the fine work so down here is an unfinished blob. I need to define that a bit. So let's do that right now. I'm going to do sort of what I'll, the, this, I don't know, what is it, some sort of barley or something up there above. So I'm just going to, even though this is not in the painting, I'm going to put this down here.
Okay. So, um, oh, this flower down here. quick and dirty way of doing all of these things. Uh, um, I think I want to get a darker brown. bunch of these little dots here again this is some kind of barley-ish thing I think this is, which is not in the original in this location but hey it's turned out that way <laughs> it's migrated down there so um, over top of these to darken them with a darker brown. Basically all the colors I'm using here are all warm colors by the way too if you're keeping track. Everything is warm um, for the most part because I want them all to, uh, to sit relatively forward. is here this
So if you're worried if everything still looks a little bit unfinished, it's because we're still, we're kind of, we haven't gotten quite the, the extreme contrasts quite yet. We ha I'm still building up some detail and um, and slowly starting to get some of the highlights and shadows. So everything right now, like if let's back up because we haven't looked at it in a while, backed out for a while. Um, everything is, my colors are a little bit brighter, as they always tend to be, I, t I tend to really prefer really bright colors anyway. Um, so my colors are a bit brighter, but I still, um, haven't gone to the dark, dark, darks, and I haven't gone to the bright, bright, brights yet. So what we have is a lot of these local colors, or like in these purples here, we just have like for the most part, pretty bright uh, purple. We haven't gone into the darker areas, so, and we don't have to. You don't have to go too dark if you don't want to. Um, but I will. This way, so I can get these. So now I'm going over top of this wheat with a bit more white in the, and yellow. Remember the light is hitting from this side, so that's why we'd want it to be to be brighter anyway. So some of these ones down here, maybe not quite as bright everywhere as it gets into a bit of shadow, but maybe a couple little. And I think we will still go back and, and brighten that up even more. I 
and then we can darken this even more. I didn't even really realize that there were these... Wheat for eyebrows as well here. Interesting. You know, let's start noticing more and more detail, right? start taking some of the same uh, yellow and start going into some of these areas up here. Trying to keep them together in their little bunches. Like, will this painting be the most beautiful thing up close? Maybe not. Just because of how fast I'm moving. So a lot of it is going to... A lot of the detail might look a little bit... You know, a little, not quite as... As nice as I would like it to be. But, um, yeah, it's not bad. Okay. Let's uh, take this brown. Just going to get a slightly different... Um, type of white here. Let's go back to the grapes. We haven't uh, touched those grapes in a while. Most of this green has seized up. Let me see, can I get away with... So here's warm yellow and warm blue together with a little bit of white. Be my highlights. Should maybe also do some. Maybe let's do the darker color first. So we'll just take our uh, warm blue with a little bit of warm yellow in there. Thank you. 
Again, I'm only just doing one side of these grapes. And it's it's a bummer because I'm just going so quickly that you know I'd love to spend more time on them, but you know, there's only so much time in the world and in life and I want to wrap up here in about 35 minutes ideally You know, I, I guess also we talked about the beginning, like, was was this <clears throat> a joke? Did this offend the Holy Roman Emperor when he saw this portrait of himself painted in this particular way? Uh, there was a, a, an, this, uh, what's his name? Uh, Rudolph II was known for being, uh, ushering in, like, a, a level of openness within the church. Um, the The whole Renaissance period is sort of marked by, you know, a, a, a embrace of ideas and intellectualism, and um, so I think I am. I imagine that. And a lot of these, a lot of like the the popes and uh, people in charge, you know, surrounded themselves with artists in their like they 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 enjoyed having them, uh, like the Medici family, who who eventually installed themselves as pope, uh, were. You know, they had Michael. They were, helped raise Michelangelo, and they would have like Michelangelo and Galileo and Leonardo, all sitting around their dinner table and talking and learning about the universe. And can you just imagine, like, how what those conversations would have been like? How how just like just I, don't know, I just find that super fascinating. So now I'm starting to go into these grapes. I'm using some warm blue, of which these grapes are partly derived from. There's warm blue and cool red in here. I mean, yeah, what I'm doing right here is verges on criminal sloppiness, right? Um, but there's so really no other way to try to get this painting done in a reasonable amount of time without having to cut some corners pretty radically here, so...
Oops, you can't see what I'm doing. Sometimes I forget that. Yeah, not, not the most impressed with the way I did that, but I don't have much choice at this point, except it will pick up the pace, so, you know, that's what happens. You do your, your best. <laughs> that was a little bit too dark. See what I'm doing. Ah. Uh, Paula asked, "What color did you put in the background?" So the background I just made is the, the my typical dark color, which is warm red, cool blue, and a little bit of cool yellow, right? And that but basically gets you about as close as you can get to black. Um, without actually using black. Okay. spots down here. So I'm just looking at like the bottom right corner of my painting. I have a bunch of, I don't even know, what, what was I doing down here? What were these things supposed to be? So I got a bunch of this, I might just significantly darken this area. So in anticipation of that, I'm just gonna th just put some, build up a little bit of color here. And then I'll glaze and darken it all, and it'll become kind of, uh, a little bit more ambiguous as to what it is we're looking at, which is totally fine.
You confessed that you painted in oil yesterday. That's great. I'm glad that you were playing with some oil. That's, that's fun. There's, there's no need to confess your use of oil. Oil painting? I think you should feel very excited to explore different materials and certainly have my encouragement and my permission. Okay, so I wanted to start uh, some brighter highlights on the the grapes here. So it's mixing up um, a green with some white. Get some glazing fluid in here. And I'm going super fast here for, I would bet you he spent weeks, weeks, I'm not kidding you, on these, on these grapes. And that's why they look so awesome, they look so delicious, right? He's got not only the reflections, he's got reflected light on the other side, so he sort of outlined them. I mean, it's a masterful job, right? That's why I say, you know, we're painting the art of these masters here. So we just have to keep making some hard decisions as to what we're going to paint and not paint. And let's do the grapes as well. Let's move on to that. Let's get some purple, so we'll make warm red, warm blue, make a purple, let's grab some white, and then a bit of glazing fluid here. So you can see every once in a while I just sort of tap it with a bit of, of my um, uh, mop brush just to try to soften the brush stroke out a little bit. Okay. 
Okay, so I'm going to try to be done here in about 25 minutes. Oops, I feel like a race. So typically, like to, when you're glazing highlights, it's it's best if you're using the actual color itself for highlights. So this would be more ideal if I was using like a pink, or um, as opposed to just this generic white that I'm glazing. There's even a bit of purpley on here. Honestly, like I've hardly looked at the original painting in the past hour or more, right? Just as I'm, you know, working quickly here, it becomes less, for me anyway, less and less relevant because I need to make my painting work and sort of a little bit of the, you know, the 
middle stages of the painting or might be where I'm looking at the painting more frequently. Okay, so let's just take a moment, let's zoom back out, see how we're doing. And I think I might now, hmm, well, I want to get some of these little rooty things. There's a f oh yeah, there's a few more places where we want to put some of these. kind of wild rootsy things happening.
Oh, man, every time I zoom in, I'm like, wow, there's still so much that I would like to do, but... Um, okay. Let's take a second, as we're getting closer here, try to wrap up in about 15 minutes. Just want to take a second. Okay. I'm pretty happy with, with it right now. I am going to mix a dark color here in a moment. finish the painting off and I'm going to glaze with it as well. At this point, I'm going to just now focus on adding darker and darker colors and then so glazing that and maybe doing some outlining just to bring a little bit more definition back to things. I'm pretty happy overall with what I've been able to accomplish in this period of time. You know, I have been painting for like you know, three, about three hours and 15 minutes. If I minus the preamble at the beginning and doing the drawing and all that kind of stuff. So, I think we're doing pretty good. So this is my dark color as I always use. All right, rather than black, mix this nice big blob of dark color and let's see I think f if we look let's start zooming in and actually you know what maybe before I do that let's just blow dry everything because I'm right at the very near the end of the painting or at least the time that I have to paint on the painting so I don't want to be smudging anything because I'm in a hurry so I don't have time to make mistakes so I got to do it right right
Whew, okay. I got these legs, the blood gets stuck at the it needs to get some movement going on in here. Someone's just standing still. I do have like a a mat under here that I stand on, which is um, really helpful. If it gets a little bit, sometimes it gets bumped to the side a bit, and my left leg is is on the on just the hard ground, and the mat is on my right leg. It's like, wow, my left leg is sore. My versus my right leg. Is happy. Okay, so but this is just my dark color without any glaze. So I'm going to go in and just do a little bit of solidifying. I think particularly in the face. I think I'm pretty happy. I mean, there's obviously I could just work on on everything longer, but you know I feel like I could leave portions of these things alone so my focus will be kind of in the center of the face like the eyes maybe f doing a little bit of the grapes and then I feel like these edge at the sides require work but not bad not bad for an evening's worth of, of work here so I think I'll just start working my way maybe down from the top here Now we're getting even darker. So we haven't used this dark color. really um, anywhere except in the background really so when we bring it to bear elsewhere it seems like whoa that's that is dark do a little bit of glazing with a, this dark color as well so it'll be a little bit more transparent So generally I'm I I try to avoid doing 
too much outlining or at least with a dark color like this um, and I can soften these up a little bit with a glaze in a few minutes but it's hard to resist doing it when the results are generally really positive Like depending on who you ask, some people will say, oh, it was kind of, I liked it better before you started outlining it. Because now it starts to get a little bit more, doesn't have quite maybe the subtlety that it once had a few minutes ago. a different approach and feels differently about things. I just always know that a little bit of outlining will suddenly bring everything into sh much sharper focus. And so generally it does a great job of especially as a finishing touch to resolve the painting. on going. I might be pretty happy with the face. Well, 
let's come down here. And this is one of the things with using a dark color and starting to outline is it's hard to stop because once one area has a little bit of outlining, it sort of makes everything else need a little bit of outlining. Everything else just suddenly feels a little bit, I don't know, um, unfinished or... Okay. Just want to give on these eyes just a little bit of roundness.
just gonna put a couple of like bits of, like even brighter pops of of light on some of these grapes. Not all of them, because they're not all going to be catching the brightest light. to be done by now. Ah! Didn't even look at the time until just again. Okay, so I want to I want to wrap up ASAP here. Sometimes you you know, I mean it's good to get lost in a painting. And I've been lost in this painting for sure. In a good way. <laughs> um and especially like I mean I it's these last this last maybe half an hour, the painting has really developed, I think, and gone a long way forward. When it comes to like adding highlights and shadows, it's it's almost hard to do too much. Because the more of them you put in there, the more depth that you'll get. Okay, so last thing I'm going to do is, where's my small brush, where did my small brush go? Sometimes I find like brushes disappear while I'm painting, that's so weird, it's not in, anyway, okay, so let's, it's going to take more glazing fluid, and this is my nice dark color. And maybe let's just zoom out for this, just so I can, sometimes it's hard for me to see this kind of thing when I'm all zoomed in. So, oops, and that's a lot of glaze. Darkening this side. 
where it should be pretty dark anyway. So we've been going around doing quite a lot of highlighting for a while. Now we're sort of doing the opposite darkening. darkening into some of these areas that I kind of didn't really fully articulate or you could just say I'm hiding them right love doing this kind of thing because it's all of a sudden feels like I can give a lot more shape to things. And push things forward and backwards and all that kind of stuff. Sometimes it's pretty scary to be glazing like this because you, know, you put all this time and effort into things and then now you're darkening them significantly where they it starts some of that detail kind of disappears a little bit. Which can feel like, why did I put all that effort into it? But the thing is, is it's not gone. It's just in the shadows. 
right? And the shadows serve such an important purpose uh, to help give, you know, volume and dimension to things that often artists neglect this because they're afraid of ruining their painting, I guess. When uh, this isn't ruining the painting, it's actually significantly, like, improving it. And the painting kind of, the more darker areas you have, the more it, it makes the brighter areas pop. So we need these darker areas to make the, the brighter areas, um, to give them sp like space. almost done um, <laughs> okay, I think uh, I could just keep on going. I could keep on going. So, I'll just leave that there for a second while I get my pen. <laughs> okay.
goodness, it's October. Sometimes I don't realize what the date is until I'm like doing this at the end of the episode. That is fun. I, you know, this is a, 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 a pretty complicated painting. And the fact that, you know, yeah, it took me four hours to paint it, but, um, I, and I could certainly, again, uh, Archimbaldo would have spent at least a couple of months p painting this painting and obviously did a much better job <laughs> than I did. Um, but given the limitations, yeah, I can't complain. It feels, feels pretty good. <laughs> what a silly painting. It's like, what a bizarre, bizarre thing. What a bizarre fellow. Um, but it, it, it's also, you know, it's just very playful. And also super, super creative. Like, what a creative individual to, to decide... To make a painting like this. Okay. Um, on Tuesday of next week, we're going to be looking at Aaron Douglas. Awesome artist. Really incredible artist. And a very important teacher. So I think is I, I think I chose him because it's National Teacher's Day, I think, on Tuesday. <laughs> I can't remember. Uh, my brain's a little bit fried right now. But um, a very, very important artist for sure. Um, and that one's going to be fun because, uh, he, he, yeah, I'm, he, Aaron Douglas is not only, again, a very important artist in his own right and a teacher, but certainly inspired generations of African-American artists particularly, but artists like myself as well. Um, so I can't wait to, to spend a little bit of time with Aaron Douglas on Tuesday. So we'll see you guys in a couple of days. Um, and enjoy the rest of your weekend while you, you can. If it's a beautiful place where you are, the weather's beautiful, get outside and take advantage of it. Run around, get some fresh air. If it's raining, <laughs> as it may be here in Vancouver, then maybe it's time to open up a good book and settle down and by the fireplace and... Uh, and um, get ready for winter because it's coming <laughs> here in Canada anyway okay everyone we'll see you guys in a few days enjoy your weekend and we'll talk to you soon thanks for painting with me please consider making a donation to the PayPal thanks everybody good night